morning we are continuing our series about being an unshakable people and so we're going to be in Daniel chapter 5 if you have your Bibles you go ahead and turn there and as you saw on the video we get another story but this time it's a different king Belshazzar and some people get Belshazzar mixed up with Daniel's uh, name that was renamed when he got to Babylon Belteshazzar but they're not the same and so Belshazzar is now the king of Babylon, and his actually grandfather is Nebuchadnezzar. There was no Hebrew or Aramaic word for grandfather, and so they're referring to Belshazzar as uh, the son, so to speak, of, of Nebuchadnezzar. But his father had actually taken the throne, he murdered the previous king, and married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, and they had a son named Belshazzar. And so this man, his father, who's, um, we'll, we're going to talk about in our Wednesday night class if you want to come out, but basically he had a conflict with a local uh, priest. And so he left Arabia and he pointed his son to be the second in the kingdom to reign over Babylon. And this is where we find the story of Daniel. And so if you remember from last week, we talked about how Nebuchadnezzar was filled with pride, and he shares his personal testimony. He looks back in time, and he says, I want to show what God did to me. I want to show you what God did to me, and how he worked in my life, and how he can work in yours as well. And Nebuchadnezzar's story ended with mercy. Well, unfortunately, we get a different type of story with a different type of outcome, He's a prideful man, an arrogant man. He's even worse than what Nebuchadnezzar was. And he is going to lose the kingdom to a nation called Persia. And so that's where we pick up. If you'll follow along with me in Daniel chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of a thousand. And so if you can imagine, what do, what do kings do in order to make themselves feel really good about themselves? Right? They throw parties. They have feasts, they gather thousands of people, and they come and say, wow, look what kind of party this person put on. Uh, a few hundred years later, Alexander the Great, many of us know who that, who, who that is, he actually threw a party for tens of thousands of people. And so here is this man, Belshazzar, uh, he's lost battles to Persia. His father, earlier in the month of October, several hundred years ago, had just lost a really, really important battle. But this guy is so arrogant that instead of readying the city and preparing for war, he decides to throw a party. Because he thinks he is so arrogant and so great that he doesn't have to worry about this country or this people named Persia. Uh, he's Babylon, after all, the greatest city that's ever been built. And so he throws this party for his lords, and his wives are there, and it says in verse 2, while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and the silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which, he had, been, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might what? Drink from them. And so they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple out of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. And they drank the wine, and they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. And so he is not only arrogant in the sense that he doesn't believe he has to prepare for battle and prepare his city. But he is so arrogant that he took a step farther than Nebuchadnezzar would have ever taken. You see, when Nebuchadnezzar took over Israel and he conquered Jerusalem and he ransacked the temple, he at least took those vessels that were in the temple and he brought them and he honored them and he placed them in the temple of his God. Well, his grandson is so unwise and so ignorant that he actually takes those vessels that were, des that were consecrated to God, that were given as worship to God, and he uses them. This is what's called to be sacrilegious. It's the sin of sacrilege. It's where you take something that's holy and you defile it. And this is the very thing that's going to bring Belshazzar down. And you know, as I was studying for this sermon, I thought, are there ways that we can take the things that God has declared sacred and we make them dirty? In other words, are there things which God has set apart and says, I want this to represent me. And when people look at that, and people see that, and people hear that being discussed, they think about my holiness. And the Bible does actually talk about a lot of things that are set apart and sacred to God. One of those things are you and I. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to read to you a passage of scripture. 
The church at Corinth actually had this temple dedicated to the goddess Diana, and Diana was worshipped through sexual immorality. There were prostitutes that would sit out on the front steps, they would engage in certain types of immorality. If you wanted to worship this false goddess, you were to engage in sexual behavior, uh, sexual immorality. And so the church at Corinth had this real big sexual problem. They were defiling themselves with prostitutes, sex outside of marriage, so to speak. And so Paul writes this command. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verses 16 through 18. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. And then look what he says here. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. You see, just like Belshazzar, who was taking the things that are dedicated to God and profaning them by drinking wine and um, partying with them, so we too can commit the sin of sacrilege by taking our bodies and committing sexual immorality with ourselves. Whether we look at pornography, or we have sex outside of marriage, or we have dirty sex in marriage that God doesn't want us to have, these are ways that we can actually be kind of like an arrogant king and sin against the Lord. Another thing that God has declared holy is the Lord's Supper, for instance. And turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. One of the things that we do here at Southern Christian Church is we observe the Lord's Supper every single Sunday. And God has declared his son to be a holy sacrifice. And so when we gather together on the first day of the week, the early Christians and the Bible itself talks about them breaking bread and taking wine. Well, there was a problem in the early church. They were being persecuted. They were being hated. And so they thought that they should just leave Christianity, go back to Judaism, and just do the things that the, the way that they used to do them. And so some of them even reached a point where they willfully forsook the Lord's assembly. They just said, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. If we can make it, we'll make it. If not, not. We're not going to really care. And one of the reasons why missing the Lord's Day or willfully forsaking, like again, we're not talking about if you're sick or if you're in an accident or if something like that that causes you to not be able to be here. But if you've reached a point of apathy to where coming around the Lord's table and taking the Lord's Supper and hearing a sermon is just not important to you, it's, this is called defiling the Lord's Supper. And look what he says here in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 24. He tells the early church, He says, do not forsake the assembly as in the habit of some, verse 24, as in the habit of some, but exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day of the Lord coming. And look what he says in verse 26, for if we sin willfully after we've received this knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Well, what's the big deal? So I make church two out of four Sundays, so I miss the Lord's Supper, I come in late or I leave early. What's the big deal? Well, here's the problem. Verse 29. He says, how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? And look at this. Counted the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified, he has set holy as a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. When we just skip out on church and we treat it like it's no big deal, and if we can take the Lord's Supper, great. If not, we are telling God your sacrifice isn't that important. I'm trampling the blood of Jesus Christ underneath my foot. I'm telling you that your grace is not that graceful, and it's not that big of a deal. It's not special. It's not unique. It's not important. Those are two ways which we can commit the sin of sacrilege. And so I want to encourage you this morning, and I'm not saying that you're doing that, obviously that you're here, but I want to encourage you this morning to look at this story of Belshazzar and examine your heart and your own mind and ask yourself this question. Am I treating the things of God that he has declared holy as holy? Am I honoring them as God would want me to honor them? You see, I am holy because God has made me holy. The Lord's Supper is holy because God has made it holy. And we should honor and respect those things which God has given us. And so that's where we find Belshazzar dishonoring God in Daniel chapter 5. Committing the sin of sacrilege. He is arrogant. He is proudful. And he simply doesn't really care about the one true God. Now, as I told you a little bit earlier, uh, Persia was waging war against Babylon. And so Persia, so to speak, was at the gates. Some historians do believe that uh, Babylon had a siege laid against it. And so Belshazzar was even having a party while Persia was on the outside of the gates, so to speak. That's how arrogant he has become. Just completely reckless. 
And so what better way to honor yourself and think that you're great than to throw this party and commit this sin against the one true holy God. And so he offers this feast an attempt to praise these false idols and venerate himself. And then something happens. Something that's not really a laughing matter. A lot of us think about a floating hand, how that may be kind of comical. But this is no joke. This scares him to death, so to speak. Look at verse 5. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite of the lampstand on a plaster of the wall in the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote it. Then the king's countenance changed. His thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried. I mean, I did a little bit of a scream a little while ago, a couple weeks ago, if you remember that, about falling into fire. That's kind of what it was like. I'm not going to do it because it makes me look like I'm a sissy. But it says, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom." And so there was this huge throne room. If you actually do some online research, you, it's actually been discovered by archaeologists. It was about 50 feet wide and by 173 feet long. We're talking about a room that's, that's comparable to this size, so to speak. And there would be this large plaster wall in the back, and the king's throne would actually sit right here. And so he actually saw this hand begin to write something on the wall. And when it says that his... his, his uh, hips loosened and his knees began to shake. Some scholars interpret this as he actually soiled himself, right? I mean, he actually was so scared, and this is true, you can actually reach this moment, he was so scared that he peed his pants, so to speak. I mean, we are not talking about something that is an enjoyable experience, and he is horrified. And so what better way to figure out what's going on than to call in the religious experts, right? The experts in the community, these are the people that you see on CNN News, Fox News, they, they have all the answers, so to speak, okay? And so he calls these people in, and he says, look, if you can just tell me what this means, I'm going to make you third in the kingdom. Well, if Belshazzar is the king and he's number one, why make him three? Well, it's because Belshazzar is too. His father is still alive, and he's still reigning in Arabia. And so he says, I'll give you purple. I'll give you a gold chain. Uh, I will make you look awesome, and I'll give you all the power you want. Just tell me what this means. And so he's afraid. He's scared. And they see the writing on this wall. But look what happens, starting in verses 9 and 10. It says, then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. And then he calls in, uh, actually, he doesn't call her in, she just comes into the courtroom herself. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall, and the queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And then in, in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom. Hey, I know a guy. He's really smart good looking. He's very intelligent. I'm not talking about myself. I saw you look at me like that. I'm not going to say that I'm the good looking guy just like Daniel. I've said it at least three times in the last four weeks. But it says, the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpreting dreams, solving riddles and explaining the enigmas which were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. This is so cool. Daniel, over and over again throughout the book so far, has been referred to as Babylonian name. But now she says, I know a guy and his name is Daniel. He is being known by his Hebrew name, which actually says a lot about this queen mother. Now, I don't think that it's Belshazzar's mom. I think it's his grandma, which would have been the wife of Nebuchadnezzar. She's got a lot of power, a lot of authority, a lot of respect, where she can basically walk through the doors, and there's Belshazzar sitting on the throne, and she says, let me put a stop to this right now. Don't be worried. Don't be afraid. I know a guy, right? That's basically what's going on. And so Daniel has developed this incredible reputation up to this moment where he is no longer known as Belteshazzar, but he is known as Daniel, one who worships and respects God. 
You see, his life was so spirit-filled, uh, so incredibly impactful. He literally said, she literally said, he can untie the knots. That's what an enigma is. He can untie uh, the knots of history that we just don't understand. And you know, I think that we should be living our lives in such a way that when a problem goes wrong at your work, at your school, people should say, I know somebody. I know someone who's going to pray. I know someone who has wisdom. I know somebody who's going to tell me the truth. I know someone who we can rely on and who's dependable because of the reputation that you have built in your families and your communities. You see, if something bad happened in this area, Baltimore, D.C., our church should be serving in such a way that the community leaders and the people say, we know a church who can change. We know a church who can make a difference. We know a church who has the answers. And that's what I pray, that God would move in our church in such a way that we would be those types of people. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. And so we should be like Daniel, having the type of reputation that makes an impact in our community. And look what happens. You'd think Belshazzar would be humbled because of this, but look at his continued arrogance in verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, and look, look at how derogatory he is. Are you Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Hey, aren't you one of those weaklings that we kind of destroyed and, and brought here? You know, one of those pathetic guys, so to speak. You're not like me, of course, who have been ruling the whole time, who have never bowed the knee to anyone. Aren't you, aren't you one of those weakling guys? This is so disrespectful, right? I mean, here is a guy who could give him the answers, and Belshazzar just goes ahead and insults him. Let's continue on in the story. He says, I've heard about you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that the light and understanding and excellence of wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give it. Verse 16 says, and I have heard of you, that you can give the interpretation and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third of the ruler in the kingdom. This disrespectful man is now turning to the only one who can give him the answers. And look at Daniel. He's ready and willing to serve. He obeys the word of the queen. He comes in to serve the king who has grown to be arrogant and prideful and they're ready to be destroyed. And Daniel probably knows this at this time. But because Daniel has worked and lived and acted in such a way, he has built this reputation up that he can move mountains. The king of the world calls him into the courts. You know, the book of Proverbs says this, a great name is better than riches. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 that the day of death is better than the day of birth. In other words, I have lived my life in such a way that I have left a legacy. And I want to ask you this morning, if you were to die today, what kind of legacy would you leave behind? Are you a parent who prays? Are you a son and daughter who serves? Are you a worker who lives according to the book and does what is right? If you were to die today, what would people say about you? How would your legacy be left behind? And then look what a good man of God does here. So he gets bribed. <clears throat> in other words, tell me what I want to hear, and I'll give you some good stuff. You know what I mean? And look what Daniel says in verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king, and make known to him the interpretation. In other words, keep your money for yourself. I'm not like these other magicians and astrologers. You don't have to bribe me in order for me to tell you the truth. You don't have to give me something in order for me to be there for you, in other words. I don't have to be tricked. I don't have to be uh, cunning. I'm just going to do my job, and I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to do what I was brought here to do. Isn't it amazing that in America, you actually have to like bribe people to do their jobs? It's, they get a salary, they agree upon a wage, and then they go to their job, and they don't get special treatment, they don't get certain raises, they actually have to do their job, and some people get upset at that, right? I mean, we live in an entitled society where everybody wants it easy, no one wants to do the hard work, a lot of people just want a handout, and Daniel's not like that. Daniel is a man of God who honors God, who serves the Lord, not because of money, but because he is a good man.
He wants to follow the Lord. And that's the kind of man that I want to be like. And I hope you want to be like Daniel too. And so he tells the king, and this is probably not disrespectful. This is probably very honorable. Look, I don't, I don't need your money, king. Let me just give you the interpretation. He says in verse 18, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples and nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he has set up. And whomever he wished, he has put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride and he was disposed from his kingly throne, they took his glory from him. In other words, Belshazzar, you don't even come close to what your granddaddy, Nebuchadnezzar, was like. He was the king of the world. He was the head of gold. He was the most powerful man that has ever lived up to this point. And you are nothing like him. And he goes on. Then he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was like the wild donkeys, and they fed him with the grass of oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdoms of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. In other words, God is in control, and Nebuchadnezzar recognized that. He was humble enough, even though he was a much better, more powerful man than you, when he was humbled by God, he changed, and God extended to him mercy. And then look what he says. He calls him out. Verse 22, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. You knew it all, Nebuchadnezzar. You knew this, but yet you have not been humbled. And there is something incredibly amazing about someone who has reached such a prideful point in their life where they know what is absolutely the right thing to do. They have seen the consequences. They have heard the stories. They've read their Bibles over and over again. And they know what the outcome of their sin is, but yet they still choose to do it anyways. People who walk and live outside of their relationship with God, who sin against him willfully, who forsake the Lord's assembly out of convenience. People who walk against the Lord know what the expectation is going to be, what the judgment will be, but yet in our pride, we choose to do it anyways. Why do we do those things? Why do we sin willfully against God? Why is it that we walk in our arrogance? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because we're sinners. We need help. See, the Bible talks about a time in 1 Timothy, for instance, chapter 4. He says, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, In the latter times, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Just because somebody says this is the truth doesn't make it the truth. Just because I preach from this stage doesn't make it authorized. I could be wrong. You could open up your Bible and you could point out to me, Rick, this is what the Bible says. Here's what scholarship says. Here's the interpretation. It's wrong. And I hope we have a congregation of people who are willing not to trust me because I say it, but are willing to trust God because he says it. He says in verse 2, they will speak lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And that's the rub. That's the hard part, is that by willfully sinning over and over again, By willfully rejecting God, we can reach a point in our lives where our sin, it no longer bothers us. Sexual immorality no longer bothers us. Pornographic material in movies no longer bothers us. Foul language in movies no longer bothers us. Gossiping doesn't bother us. We reach a point where we sin willfully and our sins no longer convict us. We don't stop and think, man, this this isn't what I should do. God, this isn't what you want for for our lives. We try to maybe start rationalizing it and saying, well, this isn't really that big of a deal. He gives some examples of what's going to happen. Look what he says in verse 3. First of all, they're going to forbid people to marry. Do you know anyone that does this? Any religious organizations that forbid marrying of certain uh, priests or certain positions? He says it's a doctrine of demons. They're going to demand to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So not only are they going to forbid marrying, but they're even going to say there's certain foods that you can't eat. Maybe only fish on Fridays or certain uh, foods with caffeine you're not allowed to have. And it's a doctrine of demons because their conscience is seared. And you know what's scary is that you and I can reach that point 
You and I can become so hardened by the deceitfulness of our own sin that we would be willing to walk in violation of our conscience and not think anything about it. I told you a little bit about the Hebrew church earlier when we read Hebrews chapter 10. Well, look what he says in Hebrews chapter 6. You see, these Christians were reaching a point where they had tasted goodness, where they had tasted the will of God, and then they turned their backs on God. And it takes a lot of hard work to get here. Belshazzar was there. And every single person in this room is susceptible to a seared conscience and a hard heart. Look what he says in verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 6. He says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. And then he gives us this analogy. For the earth which drinks in the rain that which comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected, near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. And this is scary, that we could be like Belshazzar, to where we could hear God's word, we could be associated with Christians, we could even read our own Bible. But we reach a point where we turn our back on God and we leave and we're so prideful and arrogant that even if God came down to us himself, we wouldn't repent. We wouldn't turn back to him. And we could all reach this point if we're not faithful, if we're not careful, if we're not striving in the grace that God has given us. And that's where Belshazzar has reached this point. Daniel said, you knew you ignored, you exalted yourself, you desecrated that which belonged to God, you committed idolatry. You see, Daniel emphasizes his personal accountability, that he was willfully blind despite having all the facts and all the information. He was so brazenly proud, and he wasn't even like Nebuchadnezzar. He, didn't even, he wasn't even entitled to being called the greatest, and yet he walked in his pride and his arrogance. You see, God is ultimately in control as Nebuchadnezzar said last week, God is able to humble anyone. He's able to humble the proud. And we can plan, and we can make decisions, and we can direct, but at the end of the day, every single person in this room, we all have to answer to God for our decisions. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 19 says, the, man, uh, the mind of the man plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. And so he says, look, Belshazzar, you've seen the writing on the wall. You've been arrogant, you've been pride, uh, proud, you've been prideful, God is going to judge you. And so he says, I'm going to give you the interpretation. And look what he says, let's pick up Daniel chapter 5 verse 24. He says, then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the interpretation. Mene, mene, tekel, usfarsen. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom. He's numbered your days, Belshazzar. Your days are going to come to a soon end. That's what this means. Tekel, you have been weighed and the balances found wanting. You've been weighed and the balances found wanting. You know, God would want us to weigh ourselves before he weighs us, so to speak. That's, that's one of the great things about the Lord's Supper. When we come and we break bread, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 that you should judge yourselves so that you will not be judged in the end. You get to examine your own heart and your own life, and you get to give it to Jesus. But I've got bad news. Picture a gigantic scale, and on one side is the holiness of God, and on the other side is you and I. And everyone's going to be weighed, and if we balance out, we're good. But if we go up and God's scale side goes down... That means that we've got to find a little bit of extra uh, weight to put to our scales in order to even it out. Well, here's the problem. The Bible says that God judges all of our deeds. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 3 says, Boast no more. Don't be so proud. Don't let the arrogance come out of your mouth. For the Lord is our God, a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. Job, who lost everything, said this, Let him weigh me with accurate scales and let God know my integrity. He says, I don't care what my friends think. I, I want God to weigh me. I want to know what God thinks. Psalms chapter 62 verse 9 says this, men of low degree are only vanity and men of rank are a lie and the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. And so here's the bad news, folks. You and I, we're in big trouble because as we all stand on this side of the, of the scale, we are all going way up 
And there is no amount of money, there is no amount of time, no amount of service that you could possibly put on your side in order to outweigh the holiness and the justice of God. And it only takes one sin. That's why Romans chapter 3 verse 9 says, What then? Are any of us any better? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that both Jews and Greeks are all alike being what? Under sin. And he says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody in this room is on this side of the category, including me. We are sinners. And when we weigh ourselves, we are finding ourselves extremely in want. We've got a big problem. You see, unlike Belshazzar, though, we recognize that we need God's grace. And it enables us to do good works. And one of the most powerful passages of scripture is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where it says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And he's speaking of Jesus. You see, God has offered us grace through his son. And yes, we are all sinners. Yes, we are all like Belshazzar in some respect. We have defiled and profaned God. We have sinned against him. We need his grace. But God sent his son, Jesus, to take our place so that the balance scales could be equaled. There's an exchange that happens. God takes our sin, gives it to Jesus. God takes Jesus' righteousness and gives it to us. Praise God for his amazing grace. And the question is, is how are you going to respond to that? How are you going to respond to the amazing grace of God? You know, just like Belshazzar, you know what is right. You know what to do. You know what God wants for your life. The question is, what are you going to choose? He says, mene, mene, tekel. And then look what he says. Parson, here's what this means, or peres. Your kingdom has been divided, verse 28, and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel, thank you for letting me know that my kingdom's going to end. I mean, the guy's insane. Think about this, right? I mean, if Daniel told me that I was going to die and be cut off, my kingdom was going to end, I'd be like, well, I'm keeping my stuff. I'm going to try to re- resist this somehow. But no, he keeps his word. He does the right thing. But the problem is, is it was too late. Honoring Daniel did absolutely nothing for honoring God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that every man is appointed to die once and after that face judgment. You don't get a second chance after you die. That's it. That's the end. Psalm chapter 90 verse 12 says this, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And if I could have you walk out of here with one thing about Belshazzar's story, it would be simply this, live in humility and wisdom by numbering your days as you wait upon the Lord. You see, if you live every single day as if your days are numbered and you don't know when they're going to end, that will enable you to live the way that God wants you to live the right perspective, making the right choices, walking in humility rather than in pride. Number your days. May God teach us to number our days. And look at how the story ends. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom about 62 years old. He goes and he shares the word of God with Daniel, uh, or with Belshazzar, and that very night, his life was taken. Probably some type of coup, some type of betrayal. Persia came in, and if you read in history, Persia took it without even hardly fighting. They entered the city gates very easily, took over the kingdom, no big deal, and Babylon was no more. It was taken over by Persia. And you know, there's this really fantastic scripture that's in the book of Matthew. I'd like for you to turn there with me, because this is a really important one. Matthew talks a lot about how we should look at the end of our days, so to speak, and he's quoting Jesus here. And in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking about really three things. The end of the Jewish age and the end of the world, so to speak. When the temple would be destroyed in 70 AD and when he would come back again. And at his second coming, Jesus gives this illustration. Look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. Starting in verse 36, he says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And he says, he gives this parallel. This is what it's going to be like when Jesus comes again for the second time. He gives this illustration of Noah. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. 
until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken. This word taken is paralumbano in the Greek. It means to be taken for incarceration. It's the same word used for Jesus who was taken uh, for, for, for prisoner. He was taken for death. And so a lot of people want to be taken. They believe that this is talking about the rapture. Absolutely not. This is talking about the end of the days. It's going to be like the flood. You're not even going to know that it's going to happen. One will be taken and the other will be left, he says. This word left in the Greek is aphasis. It means to send away, to remove. It's the same word used in Acts chapter 2, 38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, for the sending away of your sins. You do not want to be taken, friends, at the end of the day. You certainly want to be left. And so he finishes this illustration here. He says, two men will be in a field, one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be grinding at the, uh, the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Here's Belshazzar sitting in his palace, knew that the Persians were on the outside of the gates, but yet he was so arrogant and so prideful, he thought it was no big deal. No one can destroy Babylon. I'm never going to die, so to speak. Have you ever been there? Has there ever been a time where you just, you just really don't think about death? Maybe you're younger or even maybe that you're older and it's just not something that you really think about. We all think that we're guaranteed to walk out of these doors, but there's not a single person in this room that is not susceptible to death. We're all going to die. And everyone, when Jesus comes back, that's it. There's no second chance. You don't get another try. You don't get another go. When some people are taken and others are left for forgiveness, that's the end of the world. And so if we could learn this story from Belshazzar, it's simply this. Number your days. Don't take life for granted. Live as if Jesus would come back today. You get in a fight with your spouse, reconcile. You make a mistake, say that you're sorry. You sin against the Lord, confess and apologize and try to do better. I'd like to share a story with you. Uh, Scott Sheridan, I don't know if many people know about Scott. Scott is a, uh, a guy in our brotherhood. I've got a picture up on the screen for you. Uh, Scott and, and his wife. And Scott had been in the ministry for many years. Uh, he's a grandpa. And he decided to um, kind of get out of full-time preaching. And he's a missionary. He travels to Kenya. And he shares the gospel. He has a Bible college over there that he started. And Scott um, just left for Kenya about a week ago. And, uh, of course, you have to have different connecting flights in order to get there. It's a really exhausting long flight. But finally, they reached it. And so they're walking through the airport to meet their contact and, in order to go to Kenya. And Scott had raised so much money up to this point. Uh, a lot of different churches had donated to him and his wife in order for them to go over there and teach people. They don't, they don't get Bible teaching like we get at Severn Christian Church or we have available online. And so they can only get it by people uh, going over there. And so Scott had raised enough money to go over and even obviously put some of his own funds because he just couldn't uh, get the budget to meet. And as his wife uh, and he are walking through the airport, she collapsed and died on the spot this week. And he's devastated, absolutely devastated. She's relatively young, as you can see. They're in their 50s. They have children and, and grandchildren. And she left this world far, what we would say, far too soon and very unexpected. And so if you have the opportunity, pray for Scott and share your love with him. And he's written certain posts on Facebook just trying to walk through his pain and through his healing. And Scott and I don't know each other personally, but when I found out his story, I had to share it. And he wrote on there about his wife that you never know when your life is going to leave you. Here, they were planning to serve the Lord. And that very day, she lost her life and she died before she could even reach the hospital. And so he writes about his wife and how faithful she was, and how all he can imagine is as soon as she died, she was before the throne room, she was with God, and that she was ready to meet her Lord and Savior. And I am so encouraged by that. And that's why Christians can have such an amazing perspective on death, is because for those of us who belong to Christ, we know we will be present with the Lord should we leave this world much sooner than what we've planned. And so I wanna ask you this morning, are you ready? Are you ready, like Belshazzar, are you ready like Daniel? Are you ready like Scott and his wife? Are you ready to meet God? And if not, what do you have to do in order to get ready?
The Bible says if you're not a Christian, if you want to place your faith in Jesus, if you want to make yourself ready, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, they cried out, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to invite you to stand, to sing a song of invitation. And if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're going to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. Lord, we give you thanks for loving us, for giving us your grace, your compassion, your mercy. And God, I don't know about my brothers and sisters in here, but Lord, I know that I do struggle with pride. And Father, there have been times where I've taken my body, my mind, my heart, and my soul, and I've made it dirty in your eyes, God. Father, I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. I don't want to be blind and arrogant like Belshazzar, Lord. I want to be free and compassionate and holy like Daniel, like your son, Jesus. So, Father, give us the strength to be the people that you've called us to be. Father God, I pray if there's anyone here that has been thinking about giving their life to you, that, God, they won't put it off. They won't wait. Father, that they'll surrender to you. Lord Jesus, come. We are ready. We are waiting. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.